Amen. And that is why we're here this morning, because he lives. Happy Resurrection Sunday to each one of you. Let's all stand together. We'll sing about his uh, resurrection here. Page number 360 in our songbooks. Page number 360. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. What a wonderful blessing to know that. Amen. 360, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. 360, sing out with me on that first verse. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. Just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. Rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And that's why we celebrate. Hey. And that's why we celebrate the resurrection. Happy Easter, everybody. What a beautiful day God's given to us. Are you thankful to be saved? You know, if we did not serve a risen Savior, we'd be wasting our time. But because we do serve a risen Savior, because Jesus is alive, we can celebrate. We can celebrate any day, but especially today, you and I can have joy, happiness, peace, and comfort, and everything we need to because he lives. And it just, I, I love understanding, I love knowing and comprehending that whatever comes at me through life, whatever difficulties, whatever trials, they fail in comparison to what Jesus did for me on the cross. They fail in comparison to that empty tomb. And praise God, we serve a risen Savior. Our choir is going to sing to us about that King, that risen Savior. So let's pray, and uh, when we're done praying, you may be seated. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together here with like-minded believers. Lord, oh, you're so good to us. And Father, thank you so much for what you did for us all those years ago, how you died for us on the cross, how you were buried, how you rose again, Lord, how you are a risen, resurrected Savior, how you ascended up into heaven, and Father, how one day... One day you're coming back for us. Oh, what a hope. What a blessing. Lord Jesus, I pray that everything that is said and done here today brings you rightful honor and glory. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that your presence is very real, very powerful today, that you would deal with our hearts individually and corporately. Lord Jesus, please use the choir as they minister to us in song this morning, and please deal with all of us, Father. Please help us to be appreciative of you, to worship you, to follow you, and also to showcase you to this world that desperately needs to hear about Christ. Please, Lord, bless our services today, we ask in Jesus' name. 
Amen. You may be seated. I'm so glad that he is the only king, amen. The only king I have to worry about serving is him, amen. Well, let's all stand together, grab that hymn book, 362 now, 362 as we sing about low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. But you know what? He didn't stay in that grave. No, up from the grave he arose, amen. And I'm so glad that Christ arose hallelujah christ rose 362 low in the grave he lay jesus my savior waiting the coming day jesus my lord up from the grave he arose with the mighty triumph for his foes he arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus, my Savior, vainly. He 
arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Are you glad that he's alive and arisen? Amen. Let's take a moment now and we'll greet with one another. All right, as we make our way back to our seats, we'll sing out on that last roster, 362, 362, death cannot keep his prey, he tore the bars away, I'm so glad for that promise, 362, death cannot keep his prey, Jesus my Savior, he tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. From the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Man, y'all are so
singing like we have a risen Savior Amen. or something. Amen. Wonderful singing. Amen. We're going to receive our offering this morning, and I pray that you're faithful to give as the Lord has blessed. And he's sure been good to us, hasn't he? Amen. Let's give back unto him as he has prospered us. And I'm going to ask Brother Jared Miller, once you come up and ask God's blessing on the offering, please, sir. We'd just like to thank you and praise you again, Lord, for letting us gather here today, for giving us a risen Savior to worship, not a dead religion, but a risen Savior, that we can have victory in him and that we can have forgiveness of sins. And we'd just like to ask if there's anybody here today that doesn't know him as Savior, today would be the day. And we'd just like to ask that you'd bless the gift and the gift or giver, the message, and our pastor, that we'd hear the word of truth today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Donna for playing for us today. Sure, give her a hand. Amen. I'm so glad that you're here. Again, thank you, Miss Donna, for playing. Brother Ryan for leading us in music. And uh, thank you, guys, fellas up there, the sound booth and live stream. And looks like they're up there playing checkers or something, just hoping everything is running on autopilot okay. But anyhow, a lot of work goes into an Easter service in all different areas. So I'm very thankful for those who've done that. Miss Ann, thank you very much for overseeing kind of the eggs and the candy, those who donated candy and everything. And of course, uh, I've asked this, parents, if you're able to help us, if your child will be out that way or this way, nursery kids' ages are going to be this way, and uh, junior church ages will be that way, hunting for eggs. So 
uh, parents, if your child's going to be there, would you help us out? Just kind of be there and be watching over them and just help us. As I've said, we don't really want a boxing match over that one egg or something. So let's just keep the peace and hope everybody have a good time and take some pictures. It's going to be a lot of fun and God's given us a beautiful day. So today, Easter Sunday, after the morning service, we will have an egg hunt for our children and uh, candy out there. And then tonight we have a church at 6 p.m. Do we have choir practice? Okay, so a brief choir practice will be right after the service tonight, okay? So <clears throat> make mention of that. Saturday the 6th will be outreach at 9.30 in the morning. If you're able to go, please be here. <clears throat> By 9.30, we'll pair up, we'll go out and invite people to church. And also, that's going to be the wedding day of Brother Colin Rickenball, Miss Kirsten Hill. And uh, she's all smiling, and, and Colin's sweating back there. So we'll just, we'll see how it goes. But be praying for this young couple. I'm very excited for them. So looking forward to their big day this Saturday. Uh, Friday the 12th is the Ladies Spring Fellowship at 6 p.m. So ladies, if you have question about this fellowship, you can see my wife, Miss Laura Pearson, about that. She'll help you with that. And also two weeks from today will be the Children's VBS offering. So uh, that's when the junior church kids come up and they run around and they take your money. And 100% of what they take goes toward Vacation Bible School, which will be this June. And we'll have more info about that as we get closer. So that's really all the announcements I feel led to mention. You can see everything else there in your bulletin, so you can consult that. Also, do want to say a thank you to whoever left me a pound of Reese Cup Bunny here. I mean, that's. A, I wish I could say that lasts me a while, but it won't. It, it'll be gone before Brother Ryan's done with this next song. So anyway, all right, let's stand up. Let's sing a final song. Let's go to 363, 363, and let's sing out about that wonderful day when we see Christ. Page 363 in the Golden Hymnal. Of times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All tears forever. The sky looks dark, not a ray of light. We're tossed and driven on, no human help in sight. But there is one in heaven who knows our deepest care. Let Jesus solve your problem. Just go to him in prayer it will be worth it all when we see Jesus life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ one glimpse of his dear face I'm going to ask our ensemble to go and make their way up a year before we sing out on that last verse of life's day will soon be o'er, but we're going to be coming and seeing Christ one of these days. I'm looking forward to that day on that last verse. Life's day will soon be o'er, all storms forever past. We'll cross the great divide to glory safe at last. Share the joys of heaven, a harp, a home, a crown. The tempter will be banished, we'll lay our burdens down. Are you looking forward to that day? It will be 
I don't know what's going to do it. So anyway, praise God for a risen Savior. If you are able to, you are invited to stand with me for a moment as we read the Word of God. Uh, if you're able to, stand with me. Take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter number 22, beginning in verse 34. Please, Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse number 34. Thank you so much, choir, for singing out. Thank you so much, uh, song special, ensemble, for singing out. What a blessing that was. Thank uh, our ushers, everyone working behind the scenes with the egg hunt and just a lot of things going on today, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. But for the next few moments, I don't believe there's anything more important than what the Lord has for you from His Word. So I know there's a lot of stuff going on. I know you got plans. I know you got concerns, but let's ask the Lord to just capture our hearts and minds for the next few moments as we ponder this very important question we're going to look at in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 34. Are you there? Matthew 22, beginning in verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Verse 41, While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. What I'd like to speak to you this morning is the question that Jesus asked them. He turns the table, rather than them ask him, asking him all these questions, he asks them in verse 42, what think ye of Christ? So for the next few moments, church, I'd like to ask you, what think ye of Christ? Father, would you please meet with us in a powerful way? Holy Spirit of God, I do yield myself to you in the best way I know how. And Lord, these folks need to hear from heaven today. They don't need more opinions and they don't need more commentary of the world's events or politics. Father, they need a touch from heaven. Lord Jesus, would you please give it to us today? Would you help us? Lord, again, I yield myself to you as a vessel. Please give me the power. Father, give me the words that these your people need to hear the most. And Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you'd walk up and down these pews and, and do work in us and through us and convict us, draw us closer to Christ. Father, if there's someone here who doesn't know for sure that heaven is their home, I pray today they'd put their full faith and trust in you and get saved. Father, perhaps there are other issues of obedience and steps forward and faith issues and things like that. Lord, you know our hearts, and we ask you to please deal with us in accordance to your perfect will, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. So <clears throat> in our text, we find Jesus Christ defending his teachings, and he's defending his identity to groups that simply did not believe him nor wanted to believe him. The, uh, there were two types of people outside of his followers that would listen to Jesus. There were those who truly desired to hear him. These were the ones who truly wanted to learn. They were very curious about his teaching, who he was, and all of that. But then there are the ones who refused to believe him, and they would ask him questions with the intent of trying to find fault. That was the only reason they'd ask questions. That was the only reason they would seek him is because, eh, let's see if we can get him to trip up. Let's see if we can get him to mess up, and then we can disprove who he claims to be. So the group in our text is the latter group. Jesus eventually turns the tables on these Pharisees, and he simply asks them a deep question. He inquires to them Listen, let's take a break thinking about what everyone else says about me. Let's just take a moment. Let's stop pondering about, well, this group says this, and this group says that, and these folks think this. He stops, and he says, but what think ye of Christ? I know what everyone else says. I know what everyone else thinks. What do you think? He confronts them with this very personal question I'm glad you know of me. I'm glad you've come to hear of me and learn of me. But what do you think? You, personally. This is vintage Jesus, by the way. He always was and still is concerned with what we personally think about him. 
I'm so glad that you're here in church today, but the most important decision you can make is in regards to what you personally think and believe about Jesus. I'm so glad you're here, but we can't just have this big herd community that, yes, we all love God, that's great, but Jesus is also a personal Savior, and he desires a relationship with you. Not necessarily us as a group. I mean, as a church, we make up his body, and that's great, but you personally. What think ye of Christ? So just like in John chapter 21, Jesus asked Peter three times, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? All right, in that text, Peter, right now, my concern is not what everyone else thinks of me if they love me. Right now, I'm talking to you. Do you love me? Do you care about me? Will you follow me? In that same story, Jesus and Peter, they're walking together, and Peter gets distracted and even gets bothered by the apostle John who's following behind them. And Jesus says to Peter in verse 22 of John 21, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Bottom line, he's saying, listen, right now, it's not important what everybody else is doing. You're so caught up and consumed with, well, they're doing this, or they're not doing that, or they say this, or they think that. And Jesus says, whoa, I'll deal with them momentarily. For right now, what is that to thee? What do you think? What are you going to do with me? What is your belief about who I say that I am? So again, Jesus is insisting all throughout his Gospels that we should care more about what we think about Jesus rather than what we think about what others think. Say that three times fast, right? We want others to know Christ, but church, the most important thing is what have you done with Christ? What, are, what do you think about Jesus and what is your belief about Jesus? So this brings me to the point of the sermon today. What do you think of Jesus? What brought you here today? When someone says the name of Jesus out loud around you, where does your brain go? This morning and this evening, I want to share some things about Jesus that I wholeheartedly believe, derived from Scripture, from faith, from experience, and from historical records. I'd like to tell you to lay the foundation, this is what I believe about Jesus, and this is what he says about himself, but at the end, you're going to have to make a personal decision. What do you believe? So I hope and I pray that you're open to what the Bible says here. So who is Jesus? Why did he come? And what's my personal relationship with him like? So what think you of Christ? First thing, let's go to Colossians chapter 1, please. Hold your spot in Matthew 22, just in case we venture back. But I'd like you to go to the book of Colossians chapter number 1, please. Colossians chapter number 1. And we're going to look in verse 14. First, I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that Jesus is God. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 14, says this in Colossians 1, 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell." I believe, church, that Jesus is the pre-existent God, meaning he always was, always is, and always will be. However, we know from Scripture, he humbled himself, he came to earth, he was born of a virgin in flesh form to pay the sins of the whole world. Scripture would tell you in Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. Now we know Jesus did not start in Bethlehem. All right, we celebrate the birth of Christ at Christmas time, but we must understand Jesus, the Son of God, always was. 
he came to earth in flesh form at Bethlehem for us. Now, no, this is not Christmas, and I will not preach you a Christmas message today, but it just helps us understand God always was, Jesus always was, he just came to us in that precious, precious time in Bethlehem. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they are fully and equally God. God eternally exists as one God and three distinct persons. This is referred to as the Holy Trinity. Jesus is the Son of God and he is also fully God. Next, I believe that Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the creator. Would you please take your Bibles once more to John chapter number one. John chapter number one. John chapter number one. I believe that Jesus is the creator. I'm going to read to you a verse in Genesis chapter 1. In my Sunday school class a few weeks ago, we talked about this at length, so I'll give you the cliff notes. But Genesis chapter 126 says something very interesting. Don't miss it. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Did you catch it? God said, let us make man in our image. Well, who's us? I believe us is every person of the Godhead Trinity that was involved in creation. In regards to Jesus' role, we actually read that just a moment ago in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. But now you're in John chapter 1, and we're looking at verse number 1, John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent forth from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Now watch verse 14. And the word was made flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus, he's not only the creator. We've established that. He was there in the beginning. He was the word, and the word became flesh, and we know him as Jesus Christ. He's not only the creator, but church, he's our creator. He created you individually. The Bible goes on to further explain you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are specifically and uniquely crafted and born, and God desires a relationship with you. I'm here to tell you, my friend, you're not some accident. You're not just some unseen mass in the crowd. You were created by the Creator. So yes, He is the Creator, but dear church, you can say He's my Creator. There's, do you see the, the personal relationship there? All the way from the beginning, our Heavenly Father has desired a personal relationship from the very beginning to our creation throughout all our life. Oh, He longs to have a personal walk with us. Again, all the way back to our opening text, that's why He says, listen, I get what all they think, but you, what do you think? What, what's, what's this? How's our relationship doing? So praise God that He wanted a me. And praise God that He wanted a you. Now, how many times have you looked at someone and said, I wonder why God wanted a them? <laughs> but I'm thankful. I, I know people think that about me sometimes, but I praise God that he wanted a me, he wanted a you, and praise God he even wanted a them, right? So praise the Lord. I believe he is the creator. Next, I believe Jesus is the eternal one. I believe Jesus is the eternal one. As I mentioned previously, he always was. We read the scripture that confirmed that. The Holy Spirit speaks of the eternal existence of Christ in Hebrews 7, 3. I'll read it to you. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto us the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. 
So the Holy Spirit bears witness of Jesus, but also Jesus verifies his own eternal existence in John chapter 17. I'd like you to go to John chapter 8. And while you're turning to John 8, John 17 verse 4 through 5 says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Again, before the world was, I had glory. And Lord, would you please give me that glory back after I accomplish why you sent me to this earth to do. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 48. Please, John 8, 48. The Bible says this in John chapter 8, verse 48. Then answered the Jews. Okay, this is again another instance where they're trying to trip Jesus up. They're trying to find fault in him, you see. Uh, he could always discern who really wanted to learn versus who's just trying to cause trouble. And he's got some folks who are just trying to cause trouble here. It says, then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou my, thyself? And Jesus answered, verse 54, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Verse 55, Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then obviously this doesn't make sense to them. Verse 57, then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Watch this. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, what's the next two words? And they loved that. Look in verse 59, and they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So to the religious scholars of the day, the folks who were supposed to know the most about the word of God, Jesus' message of himself was absolute heresy, it was blasphemy, and they weren't going to stand for it, which ultimately led to his arrest and his mock trial and his crucifixion. So once more, even in difficulty, God always has a plan. Are you grateful for that? So, but to Jesus, to his followers, it was the absolute truth that he always was. He is the eternal one. He always has been and he always will be. Proverbs 8, 23, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. Wow. 1 John 1, verse 1 through 3, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. He always was, he always is, and praise God, he always will be. I'm okay to put my faith and trust in someone who is eternal, everlasting, from beginning to everlasting. Man, he's there. Praise God for the faithfulness of God. Jesus is the eternal one. I also believe that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. I believe he is both fully God and fully man. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So you see the connection here, a man, yet the Holy Trinity abides within him bodily. Fully man and fully God. You say, well, pastor, I don't know if I can explain that. I don't think I can either. If I could explain everything there was about God, he wouldn't be God. So I'm okay with the scriptural promises and facts. Hebrews 2, 16 and 17, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, or people, humans. 
Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Do you know what that means? That means when he came to earth, he elected to say, no, I want to put on the seed of Abraham. I want to be a human. I want to be made, uh, be made like unto the brethren here. Why, according to Hebrews 2, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. That means, church, he willingly subjected himself to this flesh, this lifestyle. So when you go to him in prayer about what's bothering you most, he can truly, honestly say, I understand. I hear you. I've been there. I know what it's like to be lonely. I know what it's like to hurt. I know what it's like to have anxiety. I know what it's like to be so grieved that words fail you. I know what it's like. Jesus has been there. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'm glad that not only we have a risen Savior, but we have a Savior who understands. There are people in this life who love you, care about you, and as you try to talk, they just, they won't get it. They'll say, I can empathize with you, but I can't sympathize. I've never been through what you're going through. So I love you and I care about you, but I, I just, I don't understand. We have a Savior who understands. Jesus knows all about it. Jesus knows all about our troubles. He knows all about our heartaches. He is both fully man and fully God. He knows what it's like to go through what you're going through. He knows what it's like to feel abandoned. He knows what it's like to feel hopeless. He knows what it's like to feel like everybody has turned their back on him. The loneliness, the sleeplessness, the exhaustion, the weariness, the anxiety. Jesus knows, and I'm so glad that he knows. So I can take mine to someone who knows and someone who can handle it. Jesus, who is fully God, became fully man to save us in full. He knows our trials. He understands the heartaches. He can relate to our temptations. And the best part, oh, he desires to help. The best part is he says, cast all your care upon me. Why? Because I care about you. Give it all to me. Don't just give me a little bit. Well, Jesus, you've heard enough from me today. He says, no, I want all of it. I want all of it. What a God. What a Savior we have today. In Jesus, we have the man of sorrows who understands. Yet we also have the almighty God who can deliver us to victory. So you think about this statement. We have everything we need in Jesus Christ. The man who understands and the God who can deliver. Some of y'all are excited about Domino's new $20 deal. I'm telling you, in Jesus, you have someone who understands and you have a God who can deliver. That's the total package. Praise God. Next, I believe that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, as we heard sung today, Revelation 19, 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh, uh, thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who, hath, uh, excuse me, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, in whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And Romans 14, 11, As it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He has no equal. He is above all, and by him all things consist. All kings, all hierarchies will eventually bow the knee to King Jesus one day. That is a promise in Scripture. Proverbs 21, 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. Psalm 47, 2, for the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. Psalm 75, 7, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and he setteth up another. Proverbs 8, 15 and 16, by me kings reign and princes decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. In the book of Daniel, you will find three times we are told that God is the most high 
in the affairs of man. That's the phrase there. Daniel, <clears throat> excuse me, 4, 17. This matter, uh, excuse me, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Why are you telling me this, preacher? I know he's the Lord of Lords. I know he's the King of Kings because I think you need some encouragement today also to know this. No matter how dark, hopeless, and scary things might get in this world, no matter who comes into power and what laws are enacted or anything like that, eventually one day they will all bow the knee to King Jesus Christ. Every single one of them. Even the ones who thumbed their nose at him said Christianity is an ancient religion. The Bible is no longer applicable and simply just do away with anything that relates to God or Jesus or the Bible. Even they will bow the knee and with their tongue will confess. Think about that for a moment. Perhaps you watch television and you watch politics and all this stuff. You know there's just some personalities out there very anti-God, very anti-Jesus. And oh, they'll blaspheme and oh, they'll take a stand. And they'll say all kinds of stuff. Even the biggest loudmouth, annoying guy who discounts Jesus all over, even the biggest one will bow the knee. Some of y'all are going to like that, aren't you? Be honest. There's going to be someone you enjoy watching when they bow the knee. And they confess that Jesus is Lord. I want to tell you, these kings, these presidents, these democracies, these emperors, these dictatorships, their reign is temporary, my friend. And in their temporary reign, we're going to see all kinds of stuff, all kinds of laws enacted and, and, uh, and deactivated and all these things. But one day soon, one day soon, Jesus is coming back to take his rightful place on his throne over all the earth. So I'm very glad to be on his side. I am very glad that my Savior, oh, he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he shares his throne in glory with nobody. That's good stuff. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, Jesus, I believe, is the Savior for all mankind. I believe that this Jesus we've talked about today, he is the Savior for all mankind. The Bible makes it clear that all people are sinful. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 and 23. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You say, what's all mean? It means everybody. Even me. Even you. Everybody. We broke God's holy laws. We broke his commandments. And there is a punishment that must be paid. With a holy law breaking, there is a holy justice that must be enacted revelation 20 verse 14 and 15 and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire romans 6 23 starts for the wages of sin is death this means that the payment for sin the punishment if you will the wages we receive because of it is eternal separation from god in the lake of fire that's our punishment that's our righteous punishment for the righteous law breaking we did. But Romans 6 23, thank God, doesn't end there. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So our sin, my sin and your sin, separated us from our Heavenly Father. We cannot see God, we cannot return to God on our own. So it was out of His great love for us that God decided to send an acceptable sin sacrifice to die in our place so we do not have to die and we do not have to pay that sin punishment. Say, who is this sacrifice? His name is Jesus Christ. He's the Savior of all mankind. God's love for us was on full display through Jesus' sacrifice for us. Through Jesus' blood atonement, we can be reconciled to God. Through Jesus' blood atonement, we can spend eternity with God in heaven. My friend, you don't have to go home hoping that heaven will be your home when you die. I hope I did good enough. I hope I've memorized enough scripture. I was faithful to church today. I gave money to the community and to the charity. I hope I've done enough. My friend, you can't possibly do enough. That's why God said, I'm going to handle this. And I'm going to send Jesus, my only begotten son, to die in your place. 
because he is the acceptable sacrifice. He can atone for the sins of the whole world, and he did. That's good news. The gospel of Jesus is literally the good news of Jesus. The Bible says in 1 John 3.16, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And John chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, what's, who, who, what's whosoever mean? Whosoever means everybody, right? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I promise you I'm getting close to being done, but dear church, if you hear nothing else from me this morning, hear this. God loves you. He loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die for your sins, to throw you an escape rope out of hell and into the Father's presence in heaven. That's what I think about Jesus. That's who my Jesus is. And this salvation, oh, it's available to all men free of charge. Jesus truly did pay it all. That doesn't mean I'll pay for the meal and you get the tip. That doesn't mean you get the next one. My friend, Jesus paid it all. And all you must do is by faith, with your heart, trust in Jesus and his promise to save you, and he will. You don't need to outsmart God. You don't need to outsmart the gospel. You don't need to outsmart scripture. You just need to believe it and trust it and obey it. Romans 10, verse 9 and 13, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm a whosoever. Whoever here has trusted Christ as Savior, you're a whosoever. And can I say whoever here, or whoever is here and has not done that, you're a whosoever too. This ain't just some club. You don't have to meet certain standards before Jesus will save you. He saved me at my worst. He'll save you at your worst. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know he does. And he still offers salvation to you. So just in case you were wondering, that's why we get a little excited about Jesus around here. That's why we get tears in our eyes. That's why we sing. That's why we praise. That's why we preach. Because what a great God he is. And he deserves everything we can give him and more. Now, nobody's going to force you to make that decision to trust Christ. Nobody's going to twist your arm. Nobody's going to bully you. But I do strongly encourage you, if you personally have never put your full faith and trust in Jesus to save your soul, would you do it today? Would you pray to the Lord this morning, confess your sins, ask him to forgive you, and he will. He promised he will. Call on him by faith to save you. Claim him as your savior that will take you to heaven, and he will. It's by faith. It's by trust. It's by wholehearted belief. So I close with this question once more. What think ye of Christ? You've heard what I think. I'm pretty obnoxious with my opinions sometimes. You've heard what I think. By the amens and the nodding and the praising, you've heard what a lot of people here think, but my friend, what think ye? What think ye of Christ? Do you believe he is the Savior of the whole world? Do you believe he's the Son of God? Do you believe he can and will save anyone who calls on him by faith? That's what I believe. But at this moment, it's not about what I believe. Jesus is speaking to your heart saying, you've heard what the loudmouth preacher says. You've heard what he believes. What do you believe? What think ye of Christ? Father, would you please help us now during this invitation time? Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me and saving me. Thank you for the blessings upon my life. Thank you for being so, so, so good to me. Lord, there are people all over the room here who could just praise you for what a blessing you've been, for how incredible you've been. Father, for how you've just spoiled us beyond belief. But Lord Jesus, today we have a very important question we need to address. 
Holy Spirit of God, would you please deal with all of our hearts as we ask ourselves the question, what do I think about Jesus? What have I done with Jesus? Have I done anything with him? I've heard the gospel plan. I've heard the biblical evidence that he is who he said he is, but what have I done with it? What do I think about Christ? Heavenly Father, please deal with our hearts this morning. Help us to make decisions for Jesus. If there's someone here who just needs to put their full faith in Christ, I pray they do it today and be saved. The Holy Spirit will praise you for whatever you do, however you work in us and through us. Please, please, please help us to make decisions that honor the Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand with me, please. Nobody talking, nobody moving around. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll just ask this question. Are you saved? If you're not saved and you'd like to be, Brother Matthew Chambers is up here at the altar. If you say, preacher, you know what? I I don't know what I think about Christ. I need someone to show me, or I know I need to get saved, but I've never been saved. Would you come talk to Brother Matthew Chambers to my right? He'd love to show you from Scripture how you can know for sure heaven is your home. But if you say, preacher, I am saved and I'm glad that I am. I'm so glad for that. But can I ask you, what have you done with Christ? Who have you told about him? And do you have a daily walk with him? My friend, we celebrate and make much of Christ on Easter and we ought to. But what about tomorrow? And what about the next week and the next week? What think ye of Christ? You turn on the news, you go through social media, you see these things and you're like, well, I see what the world thinks, and I hear what my coworkers think, and I know what my parents think, and I know what the preacher down the road thinks, but what do I think? And what am I willing to act out on because of my thoughts? What's my actions going to start looking like because of what I think about Christ? What is my life going to start looking like because of what I think about Christ? I don't know your needs, I don't know your concerns, but Jesus does. And I beg you not to leave with them. There's an altar up here. You can come forward and pray. You can pray in your seat. But whatever you do, don't leave here with those burdens. When Jesus says, I'll take them, I'll take them. But you've got to give them to me. I'm done talking as people are doing business with the Lord. I suggest you do as well. What think ye of Christ? Amen. All righty. We're going to get ready for a baptismal this morning. What better way to celebrate the resurrection, amen, than to see a picture of it. So we're going to sing a song, 181, in that hymn book, 181. Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God? I'm so glad we can gather at the river, also known as the baptistry tank, amen. Amen. 181. Shall we gather at the river where bright angels' feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God? Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river by the throne of God on the bosom of the river where the Savior King we own we shall meet in sorrow never neath the 
the glory of the throne. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows from the throne of God. Here we reach the shining river, lay we every burden down. Grace our spirits will deliver and provide a robe and crown. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows from the throne of God. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Close in prayer, and then we will dismiss. And Brother Ryan, I'll let you either dismiss us or call on Brother. 